I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and join me today as we leave no dye behind to use up some leftover dye socks and leave no yarn behind. Dyer Supplier has been out of business for a while. This is a Superwash BFL fingering weight yarn. Uh, ignore that label, there's actually 400 yards per 100 grams and this is fingering weight versus DK weight. Uh, I believe it was either mislabeled or I popped this inside the, the old DK weight bag. But either way, this is 100% Superwash Blue Faced Lester Wool. <laughs> I have not pre-soaked our yarn. The good news is it seems to be soaking into our dye bath pretty quickly. This is a warm dye bath. The heat is currently off, but we might change that in a little bit. Uh, and the dye bath has a lot of acid in it. It started with 24 cups of water and one and a half cups of white vinegar. And now I'm a little curious about what will happen, but I have a little bit, this is some Paradise Fibers Orange. It is a 1% dye stock. I added the dye and then I'm lifting the yarn and lowering it so it's like in another orientation. Interesting, I think I expected some of it to strike a little faster than it did. But believe me, that's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. Okay. Oh, I do want to make sure the zip ties are grabbable. <laughs> because this is how we're doing things today. I'm next coming in with some Paradise Fibers Brown. Whoops, that went, went mostly on one spot. Kind of layering and lifting. Woo wee! Getting some like random color placement. I am filling these now empty stock solution bottles with water, but we'll use that sort of eventually. Uh, I don't think I want to use all of the Cabernet dye that I have. I think I want to use just a little bit. Oops, that is a lot more than I intended and is going to take things into a very uh, pink kind of place. <laughs> and in fact, that stuck pretty quickly. Oh good, there is some on both, but mostly on one. We are going to have some major dye lot differences here. Part of me is wondering if I should lean in to that Cabernet lean. Uh, but it has not yet taken over all of the yarn, so I don't want to let it. I am going to move the zip ties though, because you can see we got so much Cabernet on that one spot. Okay, here's what I want to do. We got a ton of the Cabernet on one. I want to make it a little more equal. Pouring that on to the other just so we have a little bit more equivalency between the skeins. I also have some deep magenta that I was considering using but I think I'm going to refrain because if I use that deep magenta then we really will bring this yarn someplace that is very, very pink, and that is not my goal. Uh, my goal is to have something very fall tone, not splash a ton. This is the rinse of the Paradise Fibers Brown, and then orange. And I'm gonna turn the heat on now. Because our dye bath was quite warm, but it's not really anymore. I mean, actually, that's a lie. It's still quite warm. Did the burgundy take over completely? A little bit. But we've got a lot of the other colors in here. Uh, the burgundy, the cabernet, it is so pigmented that it really does take over. But this is really, really pretty. And I would say that I have a tiny bit of the cabernet left. I have been working on that dye stock for ages <laughs> because a little bit of it goes such a long way, but 
I think that we've created something really beautiful. So even with high acid and some heat, if you have enough water, not everything can strike right away. It'll take a little bit more time for the dye to access the yarn. And so by pouring the dye on and then moving the yarn right away, we can spread it a little bit. Now we could have poured the dye on and just let things sit, but by moving it, we softened uh, the colors. And I think we're gonna have some really nice effects also because this yarn was dry when we started. And so yeah, I'm really excited to see what we end up with. But anyway, I'm gonna set a timer for 30 minutes and then we'll come back and check in on the yarn. It's been 30 minutes and I'm gonna turn off the heat and locate our zip ties. There's a hint of some color left in the water. And oh, interesting. I was like, is the color a lot more even than I thought it would be? It is, I'm surprised. But this is a pretty sort of medium toned, almost like brownish pink and orange kind of colorway. So I'm gonna go set this aside so it can cool completely and then we can wash it. There's a small part of me that thinks I should add more color, but I really don't wanna make it more burgundy and pink and those are the colors that I wanna be using up. So, <laughs> that's why I'm not doing anything right now. Let's wash our Leave No Dye Behind yarn. And I have to say, I'm surprised with how even the color is. I don't know if it's the amount of yarn, because like, frequently to get this much coverage, I would want to add the dye in a greater volume. But we were adding really concentrated amounts of dye and moving it. I think there was just enough water that when I poured the dye in, yes, some landed on top, but the, I guess the force of the pour pushed that liquid down and into the water all around. I mean, this is super pretty, but yeah, I'm just surprised that, uh, <laughs> I'm just surprised that we don't have more extreme variation and things are as soft as they are. It's possible also that the Paradise Fibers Acid Dye strike a little bit slower than some other ones. We just had so much acid in that pot. So anyway, you never know what you're gonna get. I mean, sometimes you know what you're gonna get, but when you're using dyes you don't use as often and a yarn base you don't use as often, then you can have things happen that aren't the way you expect. And it's why it's fun to play around with a lot of different techniques. And that's why I try to play around with a lot of different techniques so that way you can learn from whatever happens in my video. And I know that it's harder to learn from what's happening when I'm doing a leave no dye behind like this because I don't always have exact measurements of how much dye and how much liquid, but I like to take risks and play around with things so then you can play around as well or if you try something the same or similar and it comes out really different, then you can think about what those differences could have been from. But anyway, I'm gonna pop this through the spin dryer and hang it up to dry. There are so many variables when it comes to dyeing yarn. Uh, you have fiber content, type of dye, also dye molecule. You have acid and heat and the amount of water that you're using to apply that dye, the application method. And sometimes little tweaks to these things may not make a difference. If you're gonna kettle dye some yarn a solid color or like with a single color and you have 100 grams in 16 cups of water or 64 cups of water, it might not make a huge difference. But there's other times like a volume that you're using can make a huge difference in how concentrated your colors are and what you end up seeing. And so that's why it's fun to tinker, but never forget how much of a difference the yarn base itself can make. Because two different types of superwash merino from two different mills might behave slightly differently when it comes to how quickly colors strike to the yarn. Uh, they also may not work that differently, they might work very similarly, but that can account for some differences you see. The other variable that I don't always give enough credit to, I often talk about acid concentration, the water volume, 
And so just like you have to pay attention to a yarn base and the source of the yarn can make a difference, the dye colors can make a difference as well. Because we've seen this a lot with color breaking and other things, but some dyes will strike to yarn really quickly. Other dye pigments won't. And so if you're trying to do the exact same technique with a color like royal purple that strikes super, super fast, or fluorescent fuchsia which strikes really, really slow, you're gonna have different results. And so some variations, even if you use the same techniques and everything I'm doing, but you're doing it with different colors, the colors themselves can contribute to differences you see with a technique when you're just mixing up the color. So anyway, I just wanted to throw all that out there. Uh, but now let's go take a look at our finished dry yarn. As I'm laying out the yarn, I'm just marveling about how soft it is. I love spinning BFL and I would say it's not quite as soft as Merino, but it's still very, very soft. Too bad this yarn base isn't available anymore. Here is the finished dry yarn. We have some lovely soft notes of color here. I think pouring on the dye with the yarn in the pot and moving it gave some really, really pretty layers and combinations. And I don't know, I need to play around with this more. So often I'm team don't stir. Uh, and that's mainly because if you don't stir, it might be easier to reproduce something. Uh, it's harder with the timing and how much you're pouring in when I'm doing something like this. But I almost don't care because I love this so much and I need to play around with more space immersion dyeing, adding the dye to the yarn while things are really just sort of free floating and play around with movement because I love this type of soft colorway. This project is a good one for talking about dye lots. Both of these skeins were dyed in the same kettle at the same time. And this one feels like it has a bit more orange to it. Uh, this one has a lot more of a pastel area. It just depends on which yarn is on top and which is on the bottom. And so when it comes to hand dyed yarn, even if things are the same colorway, there will be variation skein to skein. And the best thing you can do is blend them together, alternating rows or rounds every so often. So that way, when you go in from one skein to another, you don't see like a big shift or change. But colorways like this are gonna have change and asymmetry in them also because it's not sort of like a strict repeating colorway. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and I really do try. <laughs> I really do try to mix up my leave no dye behind type videos and play around with different techniques and different ways to throw leftovers all together. And I enjoy this as an alternative to that shoebox technique I like to do where I add the yarn into a shoebox, let it sit for a little while, and then move it and let the color spread all over. This kind of effect is fairly similar. It's just that things are hot, uh, you're doing things on a bit of a faster scale. Now, one thing I enjoy about doing cold process type projects is that I can set up a lot of them at once and I'm not constrained by the number of heat sources that I have in my kitchen. But I digress. Let me know what you think about this yarn and colorway and what kinds of color combinations you'd like to see me play with in the future. Frequently, I feel like I have multiple videos that have very similar color palettes, one after another after another, and that's because if I have a dye stock made up, I'm gonna try to use that for a video. And so sometimes that means that, well, we don't have emerald green here today. I still have some emerald green mixed <laughs> up in my uh, stash, but we could end up with a lot of emerald green in a lot of different mixtures and colorways. And so, then you, yeah, you can see the same colors over and over. But I try, I try to mix things up. Please subscribe and turn on notifications. This is the biggest thing you can do to help all of the content here. And stay tuned because we have so much more fun yarn dyeing content coming up. Thank you so much for watching.